Well, we are back in our study in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. We've been looking at the calling of God on our lives. We've been talking about the fact that God's calling is not so much a profession as much as it is a person who is Jesus. And over the last couple of studies, we've been looking at the first attribute that Paul gives, which is this idea of humility. Well, I want to continue from there and look at two more of these attributes that Paul gives us. But first, let's just read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, just so it's fresh in our minds. Here's what Paul says. He says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, exhort you to walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Again, over the last several studies, we've been looking at humility very specifically and the fact that humility is a primary characteristic that should define our lives as believers. But I want to look at two more in this particular study, patience and gentleness. Paul says that we are to walk in humility with gentleness and patience. Well, what are those? Well, I'm going to start with patience. Patience, that word has this idea, again, of patience, steadfastness, forbearance, endurance, constancy, perseverance. And it has this idea of a patient endurance of pain or of unhappiness. In other words, the emphasis, there's a few different words in Greek for for, for patience, but this particular one has this idea of to suffer long, that there's a pain or a difficulty or a trial, and there is a there's a willingness to deal in that suffering for a long period of time, which is where we get this idea of patience. Patience is not waiting before your microwave as your microwave popcorn is, you know, going three extra seconds. That's not patience. Patience is actually enduring great difficulty and trial. Here's Webster's 1828 definition of patience. I think it's very helpful in this idea. Uh, Webster defined it as an endurance without murmuring or fretfulness. In other words, there's no distress or irritation. That it's an inner calm which bears circumstances and problems without grumbling. So it's being content in your circumstances. It's the ability to wait. It's perseverance. It's the quality of bearing offenses and injuries without anger or revenge. And it's a willingness to suffer. Perhaps the best way I've heard this described is the idea of tinsel strength, which again is not something you put on a Christmas tree. It's actually the measurement of rope. So if I wanted to know the strength of a rope, it's called the tinsel strength. And so from what I've been told, again, I'm not a a mountain climber, so this is a a, a secondhand information. (laughs) But if you're going to measure rope, it's measured based on how much weight that rope can hold over how long of a period of time. So obviously, if you're going to climb a mountain and you're going to be strapped in and have some rope, right, to help you climb, you don't want a thread. You want a rope that can hold your body weight, preferably more, for a very long period of time. Because in the midst of climbing, you don't want that thing to snap. Wouldn't it be interesting if what God is wanting to develop in our life is that very same thing spiritually? That this tensile strength of soul, that this endurance of difficulty for long periods of time actually is a part of your life. Now, I know that does not sound fun <laughs> to, to develop patience. In fact, one of the worst prayers I think anybody can pray is, Oh God, give me more patience. Because immediately we find ourselves in you know, high traffic situations and we find problems in our life. And yet those are the seasons that God is developing something within us. I love the story of David as he goes to fight Goliath. And as he goes to the battlefield, he, of course, he's saying like, well, who on earth is this uncircumcised Philistine? And and why is anybody standing up and fighting Goliath? So Saul hears of it and brings him in. And he says, why is it that you have such boldness and, and this audacity to pursue Goliath? And David's like, uh, because the Lord is with me and the Lord has already proven himself with lions and bears. And I've pondered this idea before that th- there is a constant growing of the soul in the area of tinsel strength. In other words, the weights that my life can hold now, the, the, the pressures that my life can endure now should ever increase. Uh, maybe I'll say it this way. Uh, when David was first out on the fields, my guess the first time when a bear showed up, it was not easy. I mean, it's like, that's a bear. But David has already dealt with foxes and probably some possums and squirrels. Uh, that's not in the text. I'm just making a presumption. So as it gets to the bear, God proves himself with the bear. So a lion shows up and he's like, well, okay, this is a whole nother beast. <laughs> this is even more dangerous. And yet God's dealt with 
you know, possums and squirrels and foxes and now bears. So, well, he's going to help me with a lion. So as he gets to Goliath, scripture says that David says, well, God has proven himself with lions and bears. Surely he can deal with this beast as well. Do you see that there's a progression of not only the faith, but also the strength of endurance? I don't know about your life, but as I look back on my life, I, I could look back even say five years or especially 10 years and say, okay, the problems that I was dealing with back then, they were extreme and they were, they felt like they were heavy and crushing. And yet now where I am at in life, I can look back at five years ago and say, you know what? If I had those same problems, it would actually feel like a vacation because the pressures and the intensity of my life has only amplified. It's only increased, but that's an encouragement to my soul because I'm realized God is working patience in my life, that I'm actually able to handle greater and greater difficulties for greater and greater periods of time. And I know that in probably about five more years from now, I'll look back at the stuff that I'm dealing with now and just laugh and be like, you know what? If I had those problems now, that would be a vacation. See, isn't it a marvel when it comes to the pathway of godliness that as we progress in this process of sanctification, as God grows us, he gives us more and more patience. So Paul says, look, patience should define your life. That Jesus was patient. And as such, he was able to carry the weight of the sin of the world upon his shoulders. Now, you and I are not called to do that, but you and I are called to endure great difficulties and hardships over longer and longer periods of time. But we have to start with something. I often have used the illustration of a gym. Uh, about a year ago, I was you know, telling myself, all right, Nathan, quit talking about getting healthy, actually start doing it. So I went to the gym and it was just, it was miserable because, you know, I, I got to the gym and I was going to bench press. And so I put, you know, put myself down below the bar and there's no weight on the bar, but oh, the, boy, that bar is heavy. <laughs> you know, if you've never worked out in the gym, that bar is, I mean, I had a lot of weight to it. And, you know, after a while I was getting used to the, the, the bar, I'm like, okay, this is good. I, I've got this down. And then, you know, the trainer comes over and says, um, we're going to have to add some weight to, to the bar. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I'm good. Uh, the bar is sufficient. And the trainer's like, no, 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 you don't understand. If we don't add weight to the bar, you're actually, your muscles are not going to grow. And so of course, you know, we had five pounds on each side and wow, that not only do I have the bar, but now I've got five pounds on each side. And so I'm just, I'm wrestling through it. I'm struggling. And, and after a while, of course, the trainer's like, uh, we're gonna have to add some more weight to your weight to your bar there. And so we put 10 pounds on each side and boy, it's suddenly a struggle. And it's interesting though, after a period of time, right? Months and months and months and months, you know, now, now you're up to like 20 pounds on each side. It's amazing. If you ever go back just to the bar. So when I'm warming up, I'll usually just do the bar for several reps just to get my arms loosened. The bar seems really light at this point, but it's because I've been adding more and more weight to it. See, wouldn't it be amazing if God did that spiritually in your life? That as you're progressing through life, the challenges and the hardships and the trials and the difficulties and the persecutions, yeah, they feel heavy right now, but he's using that to grow your tensile strength, to grow your patience so that you're able to endure greater and greater difficulties, greater struggles, greater hardships over longer and longer periods of time. That's patience. That's what God wants to develop in your soul. With that being kind of a, as an overview, let me give you a few passages where this word shows up that I think will just kind of help us understand this idea of patience in our life. In Galatians chapter five, talking about the fruit of the spirit, Paul says the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. That's our word. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. Do you realize that you cannot produce patience on your own? You need the spirit of God for this to be evident. In other words, this is a fruit of the spirit, which means you need the spirit of God in your life if this is going to be developed in you. And I love the fact that Paul says there is no law against patience, that as this thing grows, there's going to be no limit. No one's going to say, hey, you, will you quit being patient? Would you actually start getting irritated? Would you actually struggle through less weight? See, that's not true. The reality is, is God will always consistently keep growing you in this area of patience. Now, I'm going to read some other verses, but I want to tie in this idea of gentleness with it. Paul says that your life is to be marked by humility, gentleness, with patience. That word gentleness has this idea of acting in a manner that is gentle or mild 
or even tempered or meek or considerate. Uh, My good friend, Eric Ludy defines gentleness this way. He says it's the opposite spirit. In other words, it's softness when struck with hardness. It's mildness when hit with harshness. It's a gentle word when belted with a spiteful word. Gentleness is divine control and governance over the inner man, holding the flesh in check that it is not given voice or strength in the matter. In other words, however you naturally in the flesh, in your selfishness, want to respond, gentleness is actually a restraint and it's responding in a different way. It's not just retaliating. It's not just eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Rather, it is actually giving great love in the midst of hatred or kindness in the midst of frustration and and, and arrogance. It's not pride, it's humility. Listen to some of these verses. 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says this, that the Lord's servant, bondservant, slave, must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, that's our word, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So Paul is talking to Timothy saying, okay, if, if you're going to be setting up people to lead the church, here's how they are to respond. Not like the world. In fact, they should respond completely opposite from the world because they are to be filled with the life of Christ. So they should not be quarrelsome. They should be kind to everybody that when they are wronged, they are actually patient, that they have this tensile strength of soul in the midst of here's this hardness, here's this quarrelsome, here's this wrong that someone does to you, but you endure it with great joy over a long period of time, that you're not just frustrated and angry, you are patient and you are gentle in your correction, says Paul. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Paul says, brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass or sin, you who are spiritual Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. So if someone is in sin in the body of Christ, as someone who is spiritual, you are to come alongside and help that person, but not in an arrogance, not in pride, not with a harshness, but with gentleness. I love that idea. In Titus chapter three, verse one and two, Paul says this, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, to be gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Or as Philippians 4 verse 5 says, this is actually a different word for the word gentleness, but it's the same concept. Paul says, let your gentle spirit or let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is near. Wouldn't it be neat if your gentleness was actually known to everyone around you? that they just would know that that how you would respond is not like how the world responds. That when the, when the economies of the world are collapsing, you actually respond with joy. That there's a peace in your life. That there's a hope and a constancy of, of soul. That when someone hates you, you love them in return. When someone yells at you, you speak kindness. See, wouldn't it be neat if that was known to all the world around you? Now, when you look at this word gentleness, there's actually two ideas or these two undertones with the concept of gentleness. The first one is that there's a softness, but we're not talking about a weakness. So there's a softness of soul. This word gentleness, when you look at it, was the original idea where we get the word gentleman. So when we think of a gentleman, we think of, you know, a very proper, noble kind of a person, but the word itself actually meant someone with a quiet and a gentle spirit who had an inner humility and a calm despite their circumstances. That it's one who will associate with anyone with no feelings of superiority. In other words, it's kind of a whole different definition of gentlemen nowadays. Because when you think of a gentleman, you actually think of arrogance and rude and they don't associate with the lowly. It's that kind of idea. But the original idea of gentleness or gentlemen was this idea of someone who was willing to stoop and serve and they did not think haughty of themselves. Rather, there was a gentle spirit and they did not respond like a normal person responded. Therefore, they were distinguished from other people because their response was very different. But get this, this idea of gentleness or meekness is not weakness. Uh, The Greeks use this word often to talk about a horse being broken. In other words, it's power under control. It's, It's a hardness 
of the normal temperament of life. So when you would normally want to respond by hitting somebody, this idea of gentleness is a restrained by the spirit saying, no, 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 that should not be inside of you. When you want to speak with anger and frustration, there's actually a control of the spirit in your life that says, no, 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 that's not to come out of you. Kindness and love and mercy is to flow out of you. And what's really neat about this idea of gentleness is it's not merely a restraint in the sense of your insides are boiling and you're just uh, on the inside and outside you're like, okay, this is nice. The reality is, is true gentleness is also a fruit of the spirit, which means that it's an inner working that he's going to be developing within you. Yeah, at first, it may be the spirit correcting you saying um, that angry, angry thought or that angry word you're about to speak. Yeah, don't let that come out of your mouth. But in the progression of sanctification, he's going to make you a gentle, give you a gentle spirit, which means that inner turmoil stuff is going to be lessened and lessened. So the fact that you're truly transformed, where you're not just gritting your teeth, trying not to speak angry, that you're just not an angry person, that you're not just trying to, okay, I'll be kind when you really want to be hateful. See, he changes the insides, not just what is demonstrated on the outside. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11 about himself. And again, I've been quoting this so many times in this little series, but Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle. That's that word and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus, I am meek. I am gentle. I do not respond like the world responds. I walk in humility and gentleness, but that's not weakness. Here is Jesus who actually had tremendous strength. He would walk into a city and demons would start crying out that, that they would not be just thrown into the abyss. The, that Jesus conquered death and hell. He is not a weak man, and yet he is marked by a gentleness and a humility. So don't misunderstand this idea of gentleness or meekness as a weakness. Rather, it's actually probably the greatest demonstration of strength possible because it's not given into those fleshly, normal, natural attitudes and dispositions of soul. Rather, it's allowing the spirit of God to harness your life. In Galatians chapter five, again, this is a fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, which means if you are going to walk in gentleness, if you're truly going to demonstrate this attribute, you this does not a grit your teeth and try to produce it in and of yourself. You must allow the spirit of the Lord to develop and deepen and produce this in and through your life. So one of the undercurrents of this idea of gentleness then is this idea of softness or truly responding in a different way. This idea of a temperament that is very different, but not a weakness. And the other attribute or the other undercurrent of this is a willingness to suffer. In other words, it's that exercise of that patience. So that patience that we talked about, that tensile strength is the ability to endure great difficulty over long periods of time. Gentleness is the exercising of that patience. It's the willingness to suffer and go through those very hardships. So get this progression in the passage. Paul says that you and I are called with a calling, which is Jesus. And our life is to be lived worthy. And that Again, it's the idea of a skill that we're to be equal or balanced in weight with that calling. So Jesus is my calling, which is Ephesians 4.1. But then he begins to start to list some of these attributes that is the outflow of the calling. He says, your life should be marked by humility. So your life is to be marked by the same humility of Jesus being clothed and recognized as a person of humility, which again is the heart of dependency, but not just humility, but also gentleness, this gentle spirit with a willingness to suffer, this strength and power harnessed and under control and with patience. So not just a willingness to suffer, but with patience itself that you're actually doing the suffering that you're enduring greater weights without grumbling or murmuring or rolling your eyes. Isn't this passage in Ephesians chapter four, just a phenomenal thought. Paul says that there is this high calling upon your life. It's Jesus, but there should be the evidence of the life of Christ coming out of you. So walk in humility, walk in this different spirit, this gentleness, this power control harnessed. Hey, walk with an endurance and a patience, willingness, a willingness and a practicality of, of walking this difficult thing out. But here's the question. 
The only way this is going to take place, and again, I keep repeating this because it's so important. The only way this is going to take place is when you embrace your calling. In other words, there's no way I'm going to be able to produce humility or gentleness or patience in and of my own. I, I, I'm never going to have enough energy, enough wisdom, enough strength or resource to live the Christian life like I'm called to live which takes us back to the idea of the calling itself. See, the calling upon my life is Jesus. So it necessitates the fact that I must embrace him as my calling. And so how am I going to live with humility? How am I going to walk in gentleness and patience? Well, it's the outflow of the spirit of God, the very life of Jesus, that calling inside me. So as I'm embracing my calling. As I'm embracing Christ, his spirit is going to start changing and transforming my life to look like his, that I can be conformed to the image of Christ, as Romans 8, 29 says, that I can share in his nature as first or second Peter chapter one, verse three and four says that, that I can actually have this Christian life, not out of grit and determination and self-production, rather it's through the embracing of that calling who is Jesus. Well, let me just wrap up by reading 1 Timothy chapter 6. Listen to what Paul says in his letter to Timothy. He says, But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue, now listen to the pursuit, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life with which you are called, and you and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Do you hear what Paul's saying? He's saying, hey, flee from the things of this world, pursue God and embrace, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, that idea of patience and gentleness. See, I should go after these things. Can I encourage you? Don't just listen to these messages and nod your head and be like, yes, I need to be more humble and gentle and more patient. Could you come before the Lord and say, God, I desperately need this. I I'm seeking after, I am pursuing, I need this in my life. So Lord, whatever you need to do in my thought, in my thoughts, in my life, in my heart, in my eyes, in my, in my speech, Lord, I give you full access in my attitude, in my every aspect of my life. Would you bring it under control of the spirit of God? And would you, oh Lord, make me look like you that I can actually walk in humility and gentleness and patience because I've embraced my calling, which is you. Would you do that? Would you go after Christ? Would you surrender your life afresh? And would you allow him to begin to deepen and develop these attributes of Christ within your life? Oh, that's my desire for you as we continually pursue our calling, which is Jesus.